I think we're about ready to start. Um, people are still coming, George. You made me promise to keep this introduction brief and humble, so I'll do my best, but it's quite difficult to be humble with an individual such as Dr. George Griffith. He's been around for a while. Actually, I had him as an undergraduate instructor, I remember. <laughs> anyway, that was a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> He's a professor on campus in the English and Humanities Department. George has served on countless um, search committees. He has published and presented nationally. And it's, I just can't say enough about him. The title of his talk is The Wood of Irish, which is only appropriate since we will be celebrating St. Patrick's Day this week. So it's just an honor to introduce Dr. George Griffith. here is uh, pretty dully academic, so I thought I'd better begin with a joke. This is a story of uh, three marriages, actually. Three guys who marry foreign women, American guys. First guy marries an Italian woman, and he tells her on the night of their wedding that uh, he expects her to be doing all of the cooking in the house and all of the cleaning, and he also says, and you make sure that my laundry is uh, nice and clean and neatly folded here when I want it. Well, first day, he looks, he doesn't see a thing. Second day, he looks, and sure enough, nothing yet. Third day, he looks, and boy, the house is spick and span, and uh, there's a nice little neatly folded pile of laundry, and there on the table is a big Italian dinner. <laughs> that marriage works out just well. Second guy, he marries a Polish woman, and he says to her, he says, uh, listen, let's get this clear. You're the cook, you're the cleaner, you're the washerwoman. I want my laundry, okay? First day, he looks around and can't see a thing. Second day, same deal, can't see a thing. Third day, he comes home and oh my goodness, the house is as tidy as can be and uh, the laundry's done and nice little pile of folded and pressed clothing. And there's a big dinner on the table and big plate of pierogies. Things are working out real well here. The third guy marries an Irish woman. Same deal, the night of the wedding, you're the cook. You're the cleaner, you're doing my laundry. Well, first day, he can't see a thing. Second day, same thing, he can't see a thing. Third day, the swelling in his left eye starts to go down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at the end of time, when the great roll call gathers us all together and sorts us into groups according to our accomplishments and sins, I'm afraid the rooms for lovers, chefs of haute cuisine, and efficiency experts won't have many Irish in them. <laughs> but down the hall where they put the wits, the storytellers, the liars, the talkers, and the poets, you'll be strangely out of place there if you don't speak Irish. And by Irish, I don't mean Gaelic. That's that unintelligible stuff scrolled on uh, road signs that two-thirds of the Irish themselves can't read. <laughs> no, I mean English as she ought to be spoken, the way it has been used by an extraordinary group of Irish, both nameless and famous, over the last several centuries. The Irish treasure talk. Not the kind of talk we think about when we use the word small talk or heart-to-heart -heart talk. For them, there is nothing either small or honest about talk, which they see as performance kind of verbal dance or battle. The Irish, after all, are the ones who created Blarney. If you try to look that word up, find a synonym for it in a word like French or Spanish or German, you'll be hard put. Uh, even in English, the best that we can do is flattery, and that's not quite right. The word uh, is inappropriate. Its connotation suggests something like deceit. Dante envisioned a suitably nasty place in hell for flatterers, <laughs> but not even the most virulent anti-Irishman would conjure a similar fate for practitioners of Blarney. Blarney, after all, is something you're blessed with. It doesn't send you to hell. For Americans, as a saying would have it, talk is cheap. A horrendous idea to the Irish who grant annually an award to the speaker in the Irish Parliament who talks the most. <laughs> Small talk, heart-to-heart -heart talk, cheap talk, these are ideas as un-Irish as a quiet drunk. 
<laughs> in short, in pubs and in parliaments, in print and on stage, the Irish have dazzled speakers of English ever since they outwitted the English. It was they, you'll remember, who robbed the Irish of their own Gaelic and forced them to speak English, which the Irish proceeded to do with such pizzazz that the English seemed to be the ones who got had. <laughs> I've been for some time much smitten by Irish talk, all kinds, uh, from pub talk to literary talk. Irish wit especially interests me, so I hope you'll bear with me uh, for a while while I share some specimens of that with you, and I hope that in talking about it I don't ruin it. My apologies to my Irish and Welsh ancestors, if I do. So let's see how Irish you are, I'll give you a couple of quickies here to start out with. God help me, I'm an atheist. <laughs> uh, well, now, these are Irish, not German. <laughs> the Encyclopedia of German Wit is uh, less than one volume. <laughs> Sorry, Randy. <laughs> Me mother had no children, God rest her soul. <laughs> God bless the Trinity. <laughs> A little delay here. <laughs> Getting something over TV. You know? <laughs> These are examples of a species of wit uh, that the Irish call bulls. They're concise witticisms, usually small incongruities or absurdities, whose spirit is the spirit of foolishness in play, although there's often more pointed meaning there than meets the ear. Which is why Mariah Edgeworth, a late 18th century Irish novelist uh, who wrote an essay on Irish bulls in 1802, warned us. There's one distinguishing peculiarity of the Irish bull, its horns are tipped with brass. <coughs> Another warning, quick-witted and playful, even as it cautions, comes from an Irish professor. An Irish bull, he remarks, differs from other bulls in that it is always pregnant. <coughs> <laughs> There's a sort of an ancestor, or a descendant, I should say, of Irish bulls here in the United States. If you're a fan of Yogi Berra, you'll know the bull here in America. Yogi gave us lines such as, when you get to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't come to yours. <laughs> So many people go there anymore, no one goes there anymore. <laughs> Bulls needn't always be so concisely epigrammatic. One of the longer novels in our language is a book called Tristram Shandy, written by an Irishman named Lawrence Stern, published in six volumes between 1759 and 1767. In the spirit of pedantic tomfoolery that has come down uh, to us in the 20th century, in the form of James Joyce and Flann O'Brien, Stern set out to make fun of the novel, which at the time was a fairly new form, only about a generation old. Since novelists seem so often to envision the novel as the story of a life, which in a pleasant, sensibly English way begins at the beginning, they often begin, as does Robinson Crusoe <coughs> in 1719, with this opening line. I was born in the city of York in 1632. And so, well, thought the Irishman, if you want to begin at the beginning, let's get to the beginning. So his novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Esquire, begins on the evening of Tristram's conception, <laughs> when his parents are interrupted in the act of making him, when his poor father remembers that he forgot to rewind the seven-day clock. Poor Tristram gets off to such a, shall we say, interrupted start, that he never gets to finish his life and opinions, in spite of the book's great length. So it ends fittingly when we are told that it's, it's all a cock and a bull, anyway. <laughs> Much of this foolishness shows up in a self-deprecating humor that is almost certainly the product of the Irish having spent centuries under English rule. The Irish peasant played the fool, and his face grew to fit the mask he put on. One result of that is that the Irish helped to perpetuate stereotypes about themselves that showed up all over in poetry in not only Ireland but in England. Here's an example of one that's called The Irishman and the Lady. This is by a friend of Charles Dickens named William McGinn. The Irishman and the Lady. There was a lady lived at Leith, a lady very stylish man, and yet, in spite of all her teeth, 
She fell in love with an Irishman, <laughs> a nasty, ugly Irishman, a wild, tremendous Irishman, a tearing, swearing, thumping, bumping, ranting, roaring Irishman. His face was no ways beautiful, for with smallpox was scarred across, and the shoulders of the ugly dog were almost double a yard across. Oh, the lump of an Irishman, the whiskey-devouring Irishman, the great hero with his wonderful brogue, the fighting, writing, rioting Irishman. One of his eyes was bottle green, and the other was out, my dear. And the calves of his wicked-looking legs were more than two feet about, my dear. Oh, the great big Irishman, the rattling, battling Irishman, the stamping, ramping, swaggering, staggering, leathering, swashed of an Irishman. His name was a terrible name indeed, being Timothy Thaddy Mulligan. And whenever he emptied his tumbler of punch, he'd not rest till he'd fill it again, fill it again. The boosting, bruising Irishman, the toxicating Irishman, the whiskey, frisky, rummy, gummy, brandy, no dandy Irishman. <laughs> this was the lad the lady loved, like all the girls of quality. And he broke the skulls of the men of life, just by the way of jollity. Oh, the leathering Irishman, the barbarous, savage Irishman. The hearts of the maids and the gentlemen's heads were bothered, I'm sure, by the Irishman. <laughs> Well, these are the features of the stereotype that we all know today. The Irishman is a, uh, a boisterous, uh, uncouth, uncouth uh, drunken lout. Uh, he's a brawler, like the character John Wayne played in The Quiet Man, who asked, uh, is this a private fight or can anyone get in? <laughs> a line, by the way, that's an old Irish saying, and it's not at all original to that uh, film script. Um, the stereotype is also uh, the stereotype of someone who is uh, excessively pious. He can't be taken seriously. Uh, here's an example of uh, the religious stereotype. This is a poem called Father Malloy, or The Confession. Father Malloy. Paddy McCabe was dying one day, and Father Malloy, he came to confess him. Had he prayed hard, he would make no delay, but forgive him his sins and make haste for to bless him. First, tell me your sins, says Father Malloy, for I'm thinking you've not been a very good boy. <laughs> oh, says Patty, so late in the evening I fear it won't trouble you. Such a long story to hear, for you've ten long miles o'er the mountains to go, while the road I have to travel is much longer, you know. So give us your blessing, and get in the saddle. To tell all my sins, my poor brain it would addle. And the doctor, he gave orders to keep me so quiet to disturb me to tell all my sins if I'd try it. And your reverence has told us, unless we tell all, it is worse than not making confession at all. <laughs> so I'll say a word. I'm no very good boy. And therefore, your blessing, sweet Father Malloy. Well, I'll read from a book, says Father Malloy. The manifold sins that humanity's heir to, and when you hear those that your conscience annoy, you'll just squeeze my hand as acknowledging there too. Then the father began the dark roll of iniquity, and Paddy thereat felt his conscience grow rickety. And he gave such a squeeze that the priest gave a roar. Oh, murder, says Paddy. Don't read anymore. For if you keep reading by all that is true, your reverence's fist will be soon black and blue. <laughs> Besides, to be troubled, my conscience begins that your reverence should have any hand in my sins. So you'd better suppose I committed them all, for whether they're great ones or whether they're small, or if they're a dozen or if they're fourscore, tis your reverence knows how to absolve them for sure. So I'll say in a word, I'm no very good boy, and therefore your blessing, sweet Father Malloy. <laughs> well, says Father Malloy, if your sins I forgive, so you must forgive all your enemies truly, and promise me also that if you should live, you leave off your old tricks and begin to live newly. Oh, I forgive everybody, says Pat. <coughs> Except that big vagabond, Nicky Malone. <laughs> he might have murder him, but I can. <coughs> says the priest. You're a very bad man. For without your forgiveness and also repentance, you'll never go to heaven, and that is my sentence. Oh, says Patty McCabe, that's a very hard case. <laughs> With your reverence and heaven, I'm content to make case, but since I'm hard-pressed and that I must forgive, I, I forgive if I die. But as sure as I live, that will be black and I will show you. So now, for your blessing, sweet Father Malloy. Well, Patty is not about to forgive an enemy. You'll remember uh, this line from The Godfather. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. 
very Italian line, which means not a bit of wit in it. <laughs> Compare that to this old Irish expression. Forgive your enemy, but remember the bastard's name. <laughs> Other features of Irish life, uh, the reluctant Irish bachelor, for example, have been a staple of traditional wit that depends on wordplay. Here are two poems by Thomas Moore that are good examples. These are both very short. The first is uh, titled, On Taking a Wife. Come, come, said Tom's father. At your time of life, there's no longer excuse for thus playing the rig. It's time you should think, boy, of taking a wife. Why, so it is, father. Whose wife shall I take? <laughs> <laughs> this one's a trifle longer. It's called The Rabbinical Origin of Women. They tell us that woman was made of a rib, just picked from a corner, snow sug gets so snug in the side, but rabbis swear to you that this is a fib, and twas not so at all that the sex was supplied. For old Adam was fashioned, the first of his kind, with a tail, like a monkey, full of yard and a span. And when nature cut off this appendage behind, why, then woman was made of the tail of a man. If such is the tie between women and men, the ninny who weds is a pitiful elf, for he takes to his tail like an idiot again and makes a most horrible ape of himself. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, if we may judge as the fashions prevail, every husband remembers the original plan, and knowing his wife is no more than his tail, why, he leaves her behind as much as he can. <laughs> Thomas Moore, incidentally, the author of a lyric many of you may know, uh, The Last Rose of Summer, came perilously close to shocking Irish sensibilities about sex when he wrote a book called Lala Rook, which some anonymous wit, about which some anonymous wit remarked, Lala Rook is a naughty book by Tommy Moore, who has written four, each warmer than the former. So, <laughs> so the most recent is the least decent. <laughs> Now that I have your attention by mentioning sex, I can bring in Freud. Uh, in a pioneering book in 1905, Wit and its Relation to the Unconscious, Freud proposed a by now well-known notion that wit, wit represents the release of repressed drives. I think Freud helpful in understanding Irish wit. Much of their humor is self-deprecatory, illustrating his point that one of wit's functions is self-criticism. Freud uses many examples of Jewish jokes in his book to explain his point. He contrasts Jewish jokes made by Gentiles, which tend to be oafishly dependent on stereotypes, with those made by Jews themselves, which, since they know their own shortcomings, are often pointedly witty. I don't know whether one often finds a people that makes merry so unreservedly over its own shortcomings, he wrote of Jews. He apparently didn't know the Irish well. <laughs> Try this joke, for example. An Irishman whose hearing was defective consulted a physician who made the correct diagnosis, namely that the patient probably drank too much whiskey and consequently was becoming deaf. He advised him to desist from drinking and the patient promised to follow his advice. Sometime thereafter, the doctor met him on the street and inquired in a loud voice about his condition. Thank you, doctor, was the reply. There's no necessity for speaking so loudly. I have given up drinking whiskey and consequently I hear perfectly. <laughs> Sometime afterward, they met again. The doctor again inquired after his condition, though this time in a usual voice. But he noticed that he did not make himself audible. It seems to me that you are deaf again because you have returned to drinking whiskey, shouted the doctor in the patient's ear. Perhaps you're right, answered the latter. I've taken to drinking again, and I shall tell you why. As long as I did not drink whiskey, I could hear. But all that I heard was not as good as the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Good Irish joke, huh? <coughs> Actually, I've been a bit unfair and fooled you. The joke is a Jewish joke, taken right from Freud's book. I changed the word Jew to Irishman. <laughs> Freud sees it as an example of the manifold hopeless misery of the Jews. He might just as well have said Irish. Much Irish wit is uh, self-criticizing or is evidence of what the national psyche has repressed. Consider these few lines from Jonathan Swift, his own elegy. One of several he wrote. This one is titled, On the Death of Dr. Swift. I should tell you that Swift, a devoted Irish patriot, left his estate to establish a lunatic asylum. According to some biographers, he was himself insane at the time of his death. So here's his epitaph, which he wrote. He gave the little wealth he had to build a house 
for fools and mad, and showed, by one satiric touch, no nation wanted it so much. <laughs> Here are three little poems that will make you rethink uh, words that are probably very familiar and warmly familiar to you. The three warm words are faith, hope, and charity. Here's an Irish take on all three words, faith. Brian O'Lynn, as the legends aver, was crossing a bridge with his wife and his cur. The bridge had collapsed and the trio fell in. There's land at the bottom, said Brian O'Lynn. <laughs> you gotta be Irish to get things to <laughs> Let's try hope. Everybody warm about hope? Warm? Okay. Let Surgeon McCardle confirm you in hope. A jockey fell off, and his neck, it was broke. He lifted him up like a fine, honest man, and he said, He's dead, but I'll do all that I can. <laughs> Charity. Warm again? <laughs> Life would be less outrageous if all the drinks were free, and health became contagious, and old age fit to see. And when we stretched our tether instead of loitering, we all went out together like blossoms in the spring. <laughs> Humor about such things as priests, sex, praying, poverty, and dying are staples of Irish wit, examples of what they've repressed, what authorities they feel otherwise helpless against. Weight humor is hard to avoid in Ireland or in Irish literature. One of the country's most famous novels has the word in its title, Finnegan's Wake. The attitude toward death typically assumed in Irish wake wit can be seen in this passage from John Millington Singh's famous play, The Playboy of the Western World. One character says to another, And wasn't it a shame? I didn't bear you along with me to take Cassidy's wake, a fine stout lad the like of you. For you'll never see the, the match of it for flows of drink. The way when we sank her bones at noonday in her narrow grave, there were there were five men, I, six men, stretched out retching speechless on the holy stones. <laughs> the humor is dark, the wit the product of a cosmic defiance of powerlessness in the face of death. Only in the verbal, it seems, is there power. What you can't laugh at, you can always curse. The traditional curse has been practiced by the Irish, and I might add the Scots and the Welsh, for ages. They take the form of a kind of prayer, the purpose of which is to invoke on the head of an enemy the most scurrilous and terrible things imaginable. The challenge for the witty poet is to come up with things so horrible that no one's thought of them before. <laughs> Here's a short one by that dramatist John Nellington Singh. The word Mount Joy in this little poem refers to a Dublin prison. The poem is simply titled The Curse. Lord, confound this surly sister. Blight her brow with blotch and blister. Cramp her larynx, lung, and liver. In her guts a galling giver. Let her live to earn her dinners in Mountjoy with seedy sinners. Lord, this judgment quickly bring, and I'm your servant, J.M. Singh. <laughs> <laughs> You're all familiar with the Irish blessing. Irish blessings abound, there are zillions of them, they're, they're pretty much evidence of the Irish love of sentiment. Here's the most famous one, this is one I'm sure all of you know. May the road rise to meet you, may the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Everybody warm? <laughs> That's quite warm and sweet. Uh, well. The Irish are just as good at curses as they are at blessings. Maledictions are an ancient tradition among the Irish. Malicious, malicious magic had its roots in the power of words, like the practice of hexing. Here are just a few. Curse of the seven snotty orphans on you. <laughs> Next time you're really mad at somebody, let them have it. Uh, given the curse of the seven snotty orphans. <laughs> May you be eaten by an awful itch. <laughs> Here are three about weddings. There are a whole bunch of curses about weddings. <laughs> May you marry in haste and repent at leisure. <laughs> May you have the runs on your wedding night. <laughs> 
May you marry a wench that blows wind like a stone from a sling. <laughs> A love of wit and a tradition of maliciousness makes satire a popular form in Irish wit. Another offspring of uh, wit and maliciousness is the insult, and the Irish are pretty adept at those too. Brandon Behan, that bad boy of Irish literature, once, once said of his countrymen, if it was raining soup, the Irish would go out with forks. <laughs> That's the same Brendan Behan who, on his North American tour, said, I saw a sign that said, Drink Canada Dry, and I've just started. <laughs> <laughs> the curse is a fine example of the aggressive side of wit, which the Irish have never been shy about. If you think about Irish contributions to literature, two notions strike you immediately. First, they have been greatly in excess of the size of the island or its population uh, or its geography. Secondly, their contributions have tended to come in literature's most talkative form, that is, the drama. The list of Irish dramatists is a long and distinguished one. It includes Richard Brinsley Sheridan, Oliver Goldsmith, George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, John Millington Singh, Sean O'Casey, Samuel Beckett, and that's not a list of tragedians either. It's a list of witty comedians who delight in the aggressive battle that is stage repartee or in the prospects for witty retaliation against the indignities and suffering that life heaps on us. Stage comedy affords the Irish writer the chance to say the forbidden, to allow the repressed thought room for airing. The result has been wonderfully witty lines which have filled the standard quotation books, all of them rich in material drawn from the likes of Wilde and Shaw, some of them very famous lines. From Wilde, for example, uh, this one you may know. Bigamy is having one wife too many. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage is the same. <laughs> or try this one uh, from Shaw. 2% of people think. 3% of people think they think. The other 95% would rather die than think. <laughs> or, if all economists were laid end to end, they would not reach a conclusion. <laughs> the American wit Dorothy Parker did her own turn on that same line. Dorothy Parker once said, if all the co-eds at Bryn Mawr were laid end to end, I would not be a bit surprised. <laughs> it was an Irish dramatist who gave us Mrs. Malaprop. And that's that daffy woman hopelessly tangled in the web of her own words and unable to get out. A malapropism is a, an amusingly misused word. Those of you old enough to remember the Archie Bunker show will remember uh, Archie's uh, malapropisms. Archie was the descendant of Mrs. Malaprop. <laughs> one critic, uh, according to one critic in Sheridan's play, The, Rival, the Rivals, Mrs. Malaprop has 370. 327 malapropisms, all of them, of course, an opportunity for laughs for us. The play affords the chance not only for wordplay and varying wit, but for good social satire as well, which is another Irish accomplishment. Wit becomes the weapon, the weapon to pierce the bubble of pretension, perhaps the only weapon the Irish ever had, and which they use so often against the English. Take Oscar Wilde, for example, in this scene from The Importance of Being Earnest. Here, a young man named Jack has just proposed to Lady Bracknell's daughter, Gwendolyn. Lady Bracknell, with as much uh, tact as her snobbery will allow, questions Jack to see that he is fit. So she starts with the important questions, things like taste, politics, and so forth, and then she gets to what she calls minor matters. She wants to know, are your parents living? And Jack says, I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> she asks him who his father was, and he says, well, I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I, I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. <laughs> Found, <laughs> And then he tells how, yes, indeed, it seems that uh, a man named Mr. Thomas Bardieu found him. 
And he gave me the name of Worthing because at the time he happened to have a first class ticket for Worthing in his pocket. <laughs> Worthing is a seaside resort in Sussex. Well, Lady Bracknell asked, where did the charitable gentleman who had a first class ticket for the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. <laughs> in a handbag? <clears throat> Yes, uh, Lady Bracknell, I, I was in a handbag, a, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton Line. The line is immaterial. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. <laughs> so the scene concludes with Lady Bracknell saying that it would not be possible at all for Lord Bracknell and she to even dream of allowing their only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. <laughs> <laughs> now, why the Irish in conclusion? They inherited from the Celtic paganism of the first Irish a philosophical disposition more inclined to darkness than joy that promotes some of that aggressive wit. Their history since their own Norman invasion has made of them an oppressed people. They've been without money, politically impotent, socially scorned. The Catholic Church has been a powerful influence in Irish life, and it has never joyously celebrated the pleasure principle, if you'll permit me a return to Freudian terminology. The result has been much repression, which finds its outlet in wit. And finally, when it rains so much and the beer is so cheap, what better to do than sit in pubs and do verbal battle, verbal battle with the unvanquishable? If all of this sounds dark, it is, and it has had its unfortunate consequences. Leopold Bloom visits a pub called Burton's in Joyce's Ulysses, noted for talkers who would, quote, sacrifice their mothers for a witty phrase. Remember, though, that we're all charmed by the, uh, by the Irish, a people for whom the worst sin is not something pardonable, like, say, incest, but rather that most unpardonable of sins, dullness. <laughs> Do we envy them? Would we like to be so charming? Let me close by reminding you what Irish charm is. The ability to tell a man to go to hell in such a way that he looks forward to the trip. <laughs> Thank you. Is that right? Uh, I wondered if you had uh, found never, that in your... In your I book. never heard that or never read that, but I'll believe it. <laughs> I'll believe it. Any others? Well, thank you. It was fabulous. Yes.